So welcome for anybody watching this recording. This is a self-organizing systems coaching session on uh, Tuesday, 12th of January, 2021. There are a number of questions in the chat and I'll go through them one by one. I'm just gonna scroll through them now. So one, two, three, four, five. Okay. So there's currently seven questions. Um, I think that's going to increase because I think Paul has some more as well. So I'm going to limit the time to roughly probably four or five minutes per question just to ensure we've got enough time to get through them all and I'm going to track the time here. So I'll just go through them. If anybody has to leave early or if there's a question that you'd like answered before any other question, let me know. Otherwise, I'll go through the order that they are in the chat. So Mark... You've got more on purpose. How can I help you here? What do you, what do you need? Um, yeah, just trying to uh, get a bit more clarity on it. Let me just find my uh, notes so I'm going to remind myself what I was thinking. Um, so with the hierarchy of purpose, um, I understand that you can use that but i'm not that clear i, I always, always seemed kind of fuzzy to me when i start looking at that as as opposed to accountabilities if i'm looking at like a circle and you can look at it as accountabilities then it's very easy to to then say is that circle fulfilling its accountabilities um yeah do those accountabilities sort of you know fit into the accountabilities of the wider team or if you're looking at the accountabilities of a role are they part of the accountabilities of the team but purpose seems in that context a kind of just fuzzier version of something more concrete and i'm wondering um obviously there's more to it than that um but i feel like i'm missing something i, I also i understand the hierarchy of, of purpose in the way things are structured but even with that when you're structuring something um i still get a bit mixed up between if teams say in this circle and, it, and it's it's not really fitting that purpose, surely it's also not really fitting the accountabilities of the circle. And so why do you kind of need the purpose as well? And yeah, I'm, I'm not, I feel like I'm missing something there. Hmm. You know how to answer that briefly. You, it's useful to think of them as like sitting in two different categories, purpose and accountability. So the accountability is the ongoing work that needs to be done by a role or a circle. And that work needs to be done to achieve the purpose. So all of the accountabilities are in service of the purpose. And the purpose is uh, an, a, an unachievable goal or outcome that the circle is working towards. Um, and so really, when you're thinking about accountabilities, you're looking at the accountabilities and you can ask yourself, are these accountabilities in service of this purpose? They don't always have to be. You can have accountabilities that aren't in service of the purpose just because that's where the work best sits in any circle. So they don't logically have to be. But normally that's just a good way of thinking about it, of are they in service of the purpose? And then the, when you think of a, a sub-circle's purpose in relation to a broader circle's purpose is, is this sub-circle's purpose a smaller chunk of the broader purpose? I don't know if that hit helps or not or is there anything else that, um, that angle yeah i mean i on? kind of kind of knew that bit mm. uh, I, I'm try, I'm just, I think i'm just having trouble art articulating what i'm missing i just i really sense i'm missing something in quite grasping something like um see if i can find another way of explaining it um without taking too much time so maybe one way of, of, of trying to uh, tackle what I, I i'm not getting here is i know we talked about this before but um if you were trying to create a purpose because you had a team that didn't have one that had been put together and you had a bunch of accountabilities of roles that were stuck together because yeah that's you were just forming up a a, a structure uh, i'm not saying that necessarily would be the best way to do it but it's just looking at it from that perspective and you were thinking i've got it we've got a bunch of accountabilities here you can easily kind of extrapolate from those accountabilities of the team would be a kind of 
um, you know, based on some kind of, uh, you know, abbreviated form of all the accountabilities with all the roles within it. And from that, you, how would you then make a purpose from that? Like how would you, yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know how to say anything more specific other than you, you look at them all and you kind of take them in as a whole, you know, sense the whole of what that is. And then you sense into what is it that is being worked towards by all of these different accountabilities? What's the broader unseen, maybe unarticulated thing that all of these are working towards? So that's one angle to take on it is, is kind of bottom up, you know, what's the work that, that's currently already happening and being done that we're working up towards? And then you can also look at it top down of like, well, what's the smaller part of this that is a, a part, of, a bigger part of something else? So the purpose, so the the reason for having that would be to guide, because the work's already set out in the accountabilities of each of the roles, say in this circle that has a purpose. Um, so the purpose would be used. It seems kind of in a sense redundant because all of those roles already have their accountability. So. Obviously it's not, but I'm trying to grasp like, how would you use it? What would you use it for? Um, I can see how if you're creating a new role, you might think, is that new role gonna serve this purpose? So if you were changing existing role description, mm -hmm. um, would you use it for anything else within that team? Um, how it might be used to move the team somewhere else to see does this fit into the purpose of another larger yeah. circle? Yeah. 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 You use it for that. You also use it to guide the creation of new roles. So any new roles that might get proposed in that team need would somehow be part of the um, the purpose. Um, you also use it in the broader circle, where it's looking at the broader circle is looking at this sub circle as a role, and then you know that pu the purpose of that role there needs to then be a part of the broader circle. Yeah. So it needs to fit in logically with that. I'm kind of asking just because there's a lot of circles within XR UK, let alone the regions, um, which have accountabilities but don't have a purpose. And it seems like, oh, we should go and make sure they all have purposes. But trying to convince the team that it's worth their time thinking about that is, is uh, yeah, I'm trying to come up with a, a way that I understand so that I, I feel like, well, if I can't explain to them, there's something missing there. Yeah. yeah. I, I, this is helping a bit. So, yeah. Yeah. And I would let that be tension driven. Like if there's no tension about there not being a purpose written down, then don't force the issue. Mm. You know, just just come at it if there's a tension about, well, where's a lack of purpose? You know, that if that comes up as a tension, then that's a good reason to create one. But I wouldn't impose it if there's no tensions around it. Okay, Thanks. okay. I'm just going to check the chat because I think some more questions have come in. So I'm just going to check those. Okay, so there's a few more questions in. Um, so I'm just going to, if you see me fiddling with my phone, it's because I'm just managing the time, that's why. Okay, thanks, Mark. I'm just going to move on to a question from somebody else then. So Jonathan, I see your question next. How do you ensure the autonomous teams in your organization stay in line with the organizational purpose in very practical terms? Yeah. We're a volunteer-based organization. And so people step up when they, they have an energy to do something. But often people see like, you know, finance action circle and they go, oh, great. I'm going to go and have a look at how, the, you know, I can go and decide how the money's going to be spent. And actually that not, is not the role of that circle. You know, the role of that circle in, in our case is to actually make sure that the finances are done properly and that the people who are making decisions get the right information. And so how... Um, and in the organization, we also have this feeling that we don't want a power hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And so people are saying we don't want power invested in individuals. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is we've ended up with a situation where people are very adverse to hierarchy um, and they want to use sort of holocratic principles. Um, and the question is, for me, is we have an organizational purpose. How do we make sure that the, the, the sub circles aren't just going off doing their own thing? How do, we, how do we keep them on purpose in a very practical way? And I know having a purpose statement is one thing, but maybe our purpose statements are just not tight enough. Um, 
uh, that may be the question, uh, that may be the answer, I don't know. So there's a number of different angles to come at this from. Probably one is to say that, as I was just saying with Mark there, you can break the purpose down into smaller chunks. So you have your organizational purpose and then you can look at the different teams or I think it's teams you work with or, or action circles you call them, your different action circles. And then you can say, what's the purpose of this particular action circle as a smaller chunk of the broader purpose of the whole organization? Right. And I don't know if you have those written down already, but the clarity that can come from having these smaller chunks of these purposes written down on each of your teams or action circles, and then further break that purpose down into accountabilities of here's the ongoing work that needs to be done by this team as a set of accountabilities that will help achieve that purpose. And if you do the work to clarify that, and I think Michael has been suggesting, you know, let's write down a, a, a domains accountabilities and purpose adapt document for each of these um, different teams or circles that clarity that can then be like a reference point to help people guide against oh, how far are we on or how, how, how far are we off so that's one piece then another piece is having a link between the circles so in holacracy and in some other self-organizing systems you have this double linking where you have a lead link and a rep link who are both members of both the, the broader circle and the sub circle. And that double linking ensures that um, the communication and the alignment between the circles is there. So you have alignment around purpose. The purpose of the lead link is to bring the purpose from the broader circle into the sub circle. Um, okay, so I guess I, my concern now then is that as we're a volunteer organisation, that means that um, we're going to place quite a lot of burden of responsibility on certain individuals, it sounds like. Would that be true? Well, yeah, there are accountabilities that come with the roles of lead link. And so the other part is you write down the role definitions of lead link and rep link and the other roles, you have that written down. And then whoever's in that role, it's very clear that those are the accountabilities that that person is fulfilling. And then it's easy for that person to step out and somebody else to step in. And what you're doing then is you're differentiating and separating out the power that a particular person has in an organization from the roles that actually have the power and authority to do things. And the person is just stepping into a role to put on a hat or put on a uniform, if you like, to, to play that role. In terms of time, is that enough for now, Jonathan? Because we're on sort of three or four minutes per question now. Okay, good. I'll keep going. Uh, Nunu, I, I think, I don't know if I got your name right there. Nunu Replink SOS UK. Do you know if there's an inclusion exclusion rule point in Holacracy SOS? Do you want to say a bit more about that, Nunu? Yeah, um, <clears throat> we have, in, uh, well, they're having a problem in an ex or arrow Spain. Can you speak up a bit? I'm not hearing you very well. Sorry. There's a little bit of a mess in XR Spain because this been well, this this uh, two people they are they're like super toxic and yeah, well and nobody dares to to just um to just uh, take like say you don't belong here I mean they they you don't belong to XR because uh, it's not just the principles of values they 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 they're doing everything like by uh, language I mean so now we're dealing with a situation and because I I am into souls and everything I'm looking for like uh, paperwork docs or whatever that like says or like who yeah. who, who who has the demand the, the domain or, or the, the the thing to to do that yeah yeah so i can i can help with that i don't know what kind of governance you're using in um xr spain but you can look at the governance of xr uk on glass frog that's publicly available and there's a policy it used to be on the broadest circle, which is now called the Rebel Hive. Um, it may now be on the, I think, operation circle. I don't remember if it's moved that policy, but the policy is it's, it's an inclusion exclusion piece that says 
if you want to be a member of a national working group in XR UK, these are the things that you need to agree to. Uh, you need to agree to act in accordance with the principles and values, work according to the XR UK constitution. You know, there's a few things that you need to agree to. So what that's doing is that's effectively creating a boundary around the organization saying, if you agree to these things, you can be inside the organization. If you act outside of these things, then that's something that means that you can be asked to leave the organization because you're not keeping to this agreement. Right. So that's the first piece. The first building block is having a set of criteria that can be boundaries that can be a boundary. And then the second piece is having a role that can then um, hold and maintain that boundary. And again, I don't know what um, your role definitions are, but in XR UK, if you look at the role definition of the internal coordinator, I think it still sits on the internal coordinator. They have the authority, it's part of their accountabilities to ask somebody to leave the circle if they're acting outside of their agreements with the movement. So it's the combination of those two pieces together, a set of criteria that can be a boundary, and then a role that has the authority to hold and maintain, and if necessary, enforce that boundary by asking somebody to leave. If that's not in the internal coordinator role, you can always, um, or if it is, you can always decentralize that and create another role within a circle, you know, call it boundary holder or something like that. That is then means it's not all on the internal coordinator to do. You can decentralize it, give it to somebody else, you know, partly so that the role of the internal coordinator doesn't become too centralized, holding too much power. Is that enough? Okay, good. All right, I'll keep going with questions. Um, and thanks, Ash. I see you've put the policy in the chat there. And Jamie as well, thanks for those two links. So Nunu, there's links in the chat there that refer to that quest, the things I was talking about. So thanks for that. I'll keep going. Ash, you have a question. Different definitions of harm and what are the extents of harm? So I'm not seeing your video, Thank Ash. I think you, you're switched off. Oh, here you are. Yeah, hi, thanks, Nick. Um, yeah, it's just uh, in the XR UK constitution, um, I've just posted an excerpt in the chat. Um, when doing proposals in the objection round, uh, one of the conditions um, about for objection to be valid is about the proposal causing harm, where harm is defined as degrading the capacity of the circle to achieve its mandate. Yeah. And um, where the objector must be certain the harm will happen. Um, this causes a lot of problems with people where they often uh, kind of, yeah, the, the word harm has so many cultural connotations, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. And people, I think as a result, often expand uh, the, the scope for objections to include like many more cases of where they see harm, such as uh, harm to individuals, harm to the group, harm to the image of the movement um, when yeah in this in the wording of the constitution it's just about degrading the capacity of the circle to achieve its mandate um, do you think it's sensible to kind of bring it back into that very specific definition of harm um, and is it creep whenever we fall out or do you think um, we sh should widen the scope of the word harm yeah yeah great question it's a very common question and in my experience the question is often based on a, a fundamental misunderstanding of good self-organization practice because those kinds of harms that you were talking about are often in the operational domain to do with decisions that are made around you know taking a particular action or a particular decision that is going to cause harm and these criteria for proposals in holacracy and in the self-organizing system as I think it's designed for XR UK, um, these decisions and this definition of harm are not to be applied to those kind of decisions. They're only to be applied to decisions around governance, which is about the creation of roles or changing roles. And it's very, very difficult to say, you know, the proposal to give this, to create this new role or give a new, new accountability to this role is going to cause that kind of harm to the movement by you know, harming the reputation. 
So that's why there's such a narrow definition of harm, because it's actually only about talking about governance, about roles, about policies, deleting or amending or creating new roles. Does that help? Yeah, that helps a lot. Thanks. It's always good to yeah, have that reminder of uh, the integrative decision making process is really only for governance decisions. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it's really common mistake that people try and use that for operational decisions. And I think that can almost do more harm than good. You know, it can be disastrous because it, then people get caught up in this kind of loop around different definitions of harm and all those kinds of things. And if you look in the constitution, it gives a whole different set of decision-making processes for those kinds of operational decisions um, that are not the integrative decision-making process. Is that enough, Ash? All right, thank you. Sorry, can I just ask to clarify that piece you were just saying, Nick, which was, seemed really helpful and important. Sorry to jump in. Sure. Governments, governance, it's the way governance structure decisions is what you're talking about specifically. It's the structure of the governance and, the, and that, yeah. as opposed to governance process, which actually becomes governance operational. Yeah. Does that make sense? Well, so there's kind of like something to be done, done around defining terms here. Right. So Sorry. how these yeah. terms are defined in, in the Coloxy Constitution and the adaptation of it that is the XRUK Constitution, gov what governance refers to, the term governance, refers to the set of role definitions and right. policies. Yeah. yeah, that's, that's what you said. Great, thank you. Yeah. Then the governance process is what Ash called the integrative decision-making process. Yeah. That's the pr process that you use to change those role definitions and policies of the organization. Hmm. Does that answer it? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. I'm going to just check the question to see how I'm... Sorry, Nick, one, one additional quick question, if I may. Yeah. Um, if you could add a word to harm to accurate, more accurately specify what is meant, or, or how, how, in your experience, would, would you change the term harm to make it more apparent to people less familiar with the SOS what is actually being covered? Well, the definition that's given in the Constitution is it would degrade the capacity of the circle to achieve its mandate. Mm. And I think if you're limiting, if you're just applying that criteria, that definition of harm to just governance decisions, I think it's actually really, really works. You know, my experience of eight years of working with Holacracy, it's the best definition that I found. But if we were to call it, say, structural harm, do you think that would encapsulate it more clearly for people? What, what, what do you think might, if we change the term, the name? Well, it would depend for me on what was the tension behind needing to change the term than hmm. to fully understand what that tension is of the, the reason for doing it. Okay, rather, than, rather than kind of abstractly. Yeah. Okay, I'm just going to check the questions and see how I'm doing for time. So we've got one, two. Three, four, five, six, seven. Eight. Are we still with so some more questions have come in and we've still got nine questions left. So I'm going to have to reduce the time even more. So that's about three to four minutes, three minutes roughly per question. All right. How's it going, everybody? We're about halfway through. How are we doing? Is this useful? Interesting? Still awake? Still with me? Okay, good. Always good to check in. Um, Jamie, holocratic approaches to managing accountability of subteams. Can you expand on that a bit? Yeah, sorry, I didn't mean so. I didn't mean to use the word accountability um, confusingly. I, I was thinking particularly about the way that super circles can. Uh, what what different methods are used in different holocratic systems for super circles to track progress of sub circles against objectives? You know that they're actually making progress and and outcomes. Mm -hmm. So, in how it works in Holacracy and some other organizations that, that work in similar ways. Um, I did try and introduce this in XR UK and it didn't really stick uh, very well, I think, is the idea of visibility around projects. So basically any outcome that anyone is working towards in a role uh, that is relevant for other roles or people to know about, they post them on a project board that everybody can see like a virtual project board and then at the beginning of each uh, meeting, that's not a governance meeting, but more of an operational meeting or a tactical meeting, 
there's a section of the meeting that's called project updates and each role reports on those projects only what has changed since the last time anybody reported on it or the last time you had a meeting so the project updates is very snappy it's very quick it might only be a couple of words or one sentence about anything that's changed since the last time you reported on it and that's a good way of providing visibility you can also have checklists and metrics checklists are checking whether recurring actions have been completed or not on a regular basis and metrics are there any things that you need to be measured uh, you know like number of hits on a website or amount of money in a bank account and you can have those three things you can have checklists me checklists metrics and project updates all at the beginning of a meeting before you go into um, the agenda and that provides a lot of visibility and transparency around the current status of work and what's going on and that can also create tensions then or generate tensions for people to bring up in the meeting that's kind of classic holacracy and then people vary do variations of those things some organizations that use holacracy use um or self-organizing use okrs you know objectives and key results and there's a whole way of aligning what circles are doing with a whole set of objectives and key results there does that is there anything else on that jamie or does that answer that for you um, I guess it answers in a roundabout way. If you made those then available to your super circle, then they would be able to to see how you're getting on, right? Yeah. So to, to provide exactly. the visibility is the last part of the, the puzzle. Yeah. yeah. So you do that internally in your circle, and then the super circle can ask for any of that, any of those things that are within the sub circle can ask for that visibility at the super circle level. And it's up for the external coordinator of the sub circle to then report on those things to the super circle. Okay, great. Paul, coming to you. Any particular quick order to answer your questions in? Yeah, I think I'll, I'll we'll forget the last one, number three. I think we can do that another time because time is short and that can combine the first two okay. into one. The background to this is I'm um, XR Midlands um, SOS um, link or rep link. And um, we were discussing with the Nottingham group last Tuesday at the anchor um circle meeting how mm -hmm. to proceed with next steps for sos within nottingham yeah mm -hmm. so i just sat back and took notes of the discussion and this question really is a summation really of, of some of the key things that come out i think some people perceive sos as very technocratic and, and rules based which is fine because it has to be that way but not everybody thinks in that way you know and so there was a kind of discussion around where does this where does the vision the strategy um fit within this process it's great to have a set of rules and defined roles and blah 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 and to me this is where regen or something akin to it comes in because um one has to have i think some form of empathy for the people who don't have the faith in the sos system and think of another way of translating it into a way that they see the value of does that make sense yeah it does um and this is this is one of the hazards really of trying to introduce you know trying to bring in introduce a new way of working into a moot into a kind of informal global grassroots movement like xr where people are coming in from multiple different worldviews and backgrounds and contexts and coming together under this association and then suddenly there's these set of rules that they need to operate under that they're supposed to govern them and that there's not any enough resources in place to fully introduce and kind of onboard them so that they can understand um, what it's about the reasons for them and why they might be a good idea so this is just like the first part of an answer so you know i was very hesitant at the very beginning of even introducing something like this to xr uk but there was a situation where XR UK said we're using holacracy where they clearly weren't and they were clearly misusing some concepts so I tried to kind of come in and help clear it up but ideally what you would have is a step-by-step a, a -step modular approach that when somebody comes into XR they kind of gently step-by-step -step introduced to different parts of what self-organizing means the different building blocks of a system how you put them together and how together they form this coherent system and then, in my experience, when people actually understand what it's about, uh, 
because they've been introduced to it in that way, step by step. They then like don't have a problem. It's like, oh, well, it makes sense working like this because otherwise it's a bit chaotic and then nobody knows what anybody else is doing and it um, can get really confusing when we get into these power struggles. Mm -hmm. But if we have this bit of um, process and structure, it can give us this clarity in these ways of working. So that's not a direct answer to, to your question. It's a kind of indirect, like kind of here's the context and why the context makes it difficult. And I just piggyback something on that then, because I think that would be very useful for our organization too. And I'm wondering if you could just direct us towards any kind of easy to assimilate uh, material, sort of introducing people to the building blocks of self-organizing systems. Well, that's work I'm currently developing because um, I haven't seen it easily being done in, in elsewhere. So the latest version of the Holacracy Constitution is version 5.0, which is introducing a modular approach. So that's probably the a place to go is there are these five articles you can introduce the articles one article at a time so one module at a time per article and it those are the building those are some of the ways of having the building blocks and so i have been talking with people in x i've been suggesting with people in xr uk you know how about doing it in this more kind of building block lego approach so that's one angle of answering your question paul the other angle is you know given that they are coming in with this and there is this stuff around vision and strategy and so like none of that stuff vision strategy is defined by the constitution and it's all up to groups and circles to figure out themselves how to do that to figure out their own visioning strategy and their own visioning process and how they define their own strategies that's not defined by the rules in the constitution but i would suggest that it's helpful because that all of those things are ongoing work that needs to be done, you know, uh, defining, evolving and updating a purpose, defining, involving and updating a strategy. That's all work that needs to be done. I would suggest if people recognize that work, that's work that needs to be done to propose something in governance around creating a role or roles to do that work and then have, having circles or, or roles to do that and encoding that work there. So that people can then see, oh, there's somewhere in this structure where that work lives. The work of creating a vision and evolving that vision. And that could just sit with one circle or one person, or it could just be about defining a process that includes a whole load of people in how that's done. How is that landing with you, Paul? Do you want to come back on any of that? No, it's, it's really good stuff. Um... It, it's kind of it kind of clarifies what I thought I think I was um, starting to realize anyway, but we're all new to this and um, it's really useful to get some validation or verification from someone like yourself who has more experience. So what this does is it gives us greater, um, I think, clarity to move forward in a way which is constructive and perhaps is the, the right direction. So thanks for that. It's okay. And I think you asked a question in our last session where I sent you some material about, mm -hmm. you know, one of the first steps on someone's journey in this is, is a readiness assessment. So for yeah. everybody else listening, you know, the, the first step, even before introducing any of this, is if you can do a readiness assessment with groups of like, how ready are you to adopt these new ways of working? Then I've got a set of materials that include an introduction, it includes a survey, it includes a follow-up meeting, and then it includes a decision around is a group ready or not? And that readiness assessment is almost like a kind of prerequisite to introducing anything um, that would be so kind of formal. And then you would, you would want to be, after assessing that a group's ready, you can then um, invite people to make a commitment to trying these new ways of working, and then you can introduce them step by step. So this is all like, um, yeah, ways of going about doing those things. Am I okay to move on, Paul? Certainly, yeah, okay. no worries. Let me just check how I'm doing. So, okay, you go on to Michael, your question. Hey, thanks, Nick. Um, I'm from Mankind Project um, UK, uh, we're a charity. And we are currently trying to make our organization into a self-organizing one. So your previous remarks about, you know, what is needed to make a self-organization, self-organizing organizations really useful. 
Um, so my question is that we've got a circle that is really all about how we make our, our organization a self-organizing organization. And we've got this DAP thing that you know about. And my idea is that we give our circle um, some accountabilities and domains. Um, so on top of that, there's this thing, which is really an anchor circle, which, which contains all the other circles. And I think that the people kind of think that once we get this anchor circle sorted, then we won't need this other circle, this team teal circle. Uh, so I'm, I'm kind of thinking that that team teal circle will probably need to persist, you know, some while after um, the council is set up. And um, I'm not really sure what my question is, but um, I'm kind of a little bit frustrated, I guess, about the fact that um, I, I kind of feel that that will be needed and other people just think, okay, when we get council set up, this anchor circle, then everything will be fine. Beautiful. Love it. It's a really, really great question, Michael, which gives me an opportunity to bring in a kind of like an aspect of the paradigm shift that's involved in in moving from more of a conventional way of organizing, even though it sound, sounds like, you know, Jonathan said your organization is anti-hierarchy or, you know, it's resistance to hierarchy. Um, the shift that happens in moving to self-organizing, which is this idea of dynamic steering and dynamic governance, where it's not that a, a role or a team or a circle or any part of governance is static and is there for the long term. The idea that uh, the, the part of an organization is only there to serve a particular purpose and to do any ongoing work for the organization as long as it's needed. And if you have regular governance meetings or some kind of ongoing governance process that can easily adapt your governance in response to changes that are happening internally or externally in the world, then your organism, if you think of your organization as an organism, your organism is constantly adapting and flexing and in response to what's happening. And then the question becomes irrelevant of, is this gonna be a permanent circle or not? Is like, it exists for as long as there's a function for it and we can change it at any time because we have a clear and robust process for doing that. It may change in the future, it may disappear in the future, you know, who knows what's gonna happen. And we don't need to know because we have an effective process for adapting as we need to. That makes a lot of sense. So I think what I'm thinking is that Team Teal as accountabilities and domains will also have to have that kind of governance process baked into it, because I think that Team Teal will be the circle that will try to introduce that way of working to all the other circles. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Moving on. Um, Emily, you have a question. Do you want to speak to that? Yeah, Welcome. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so I'm one of the regional reps in the um, Rebel Hive, so in um, in XR, and we've been thinking for quite a long time about um, the process for uh, decision making processes for uh, changing the uh, the demands. And Mark helpfully made some comments the other day, actually. And I think we've, I mean, just keep coming up again and again with like the process, like not being able to make a decision because we can't even decide on the kind of process come kind of starting processes and they haven't quite worked and not being clear like whose mandate is to make the decision. I think as we've kind of established as the wider circle that the hive can hold the process but can't kind of make the decision. I think we're just getting a bit stuck about um, the, the best steps for something that needs to kind of incorporate so many decisions, so many different circles and um, so many different kind of conflicting views of how to go about it. Mm. Um, yeah, so I just wondered if you had any, we were thinking about convergent facilitation, but um, I just wondered if you had any thoughts about the kind of, even just getting the process of deciding the process started, mm. almost we're going around in circles a bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So again, I, I give this response to a lot of questions, which is try and allow it to be tension driven and there's a lot in that in that answer because it it involves um people being able to sense tensions and then knowing how to process those tensions 
So it's and then whoever's sensing attention about something, it's then on them to bring a proposal to resolve that tension. And again, we're talking in probably in the domain of governance here, where it's a, it's either you either want a policy, and what a policy would do is a policy would define the process by which the demands are changed. So anybody who has attention about this anywhere in, the, in XR UK can kind of escalate this up to the rebel hive circle. And then that whoever it gets escalated to can make a proposal for here's how I think the demands should be changed and they can propose a policy for that. Um, that's one way of doing it. Or they could propose a role or a circle that could be mandated with creating a policy for how that's done. The process for how you do it and um, that could be very simple or it could be very elaborate and involve lots of democratic consultation and participation so really what i'm saying to you is is i'm not giving you an answer of how to how to do it but here's the options for inviting people to just to, to act from their tensions where attention they're feeling make a proposal and then if they're using the integrative decision making process well that will then raise objections from people that can then be integrated if they're valid objections. Does that make sense? So really you want a policy or a role or a circle to, to be working on it. Yeah. Is that enough? Good. Okay. So we've got a um, quarter of an hour left. Let me see how many questions are left. One, two, three maybe three questions left paul do you have any is paul still there yeah i know you had a number of different questions and said some weren't so relevant are, all, have you got any questions left paul um just the last one very quickly was if we had time was constitutions again it comes back to the rule book a bit i think um constitution to me um is a set of rules that need to be followed in in parallel with the SOS self-organizing system rule book, if you like. Do you think um, at local level, local groups need to have their own constitution? And if so, are there any good examples that could be adopted that you're aware of? Yeah. In, in relation to XR. Yeah. These questions come up a lot. Um, I really think that it's not a good idea for local groups to have a constitution institution just because of what I was saying earlier about it being too bureaucratic there's all these rules how do we even understand what the rules are let alone how to follow them and let alone to bloody well want to follow them you know where have they come from and why are they there you know the kind of atmosphere and um, vibe of a local group is much less formal um, so you know unless you have a load of people who are really familiar with self-organizing and really understand the principles and reasons for doing it and are really experienced and want, want to do it you know then great and maybe in some time in the future so this kind of thing will be much better known so there'll be much more capacity to do that but without that i know that a number of kind of very lightweight adaptations for local groups have been created of like just one or two pages of like suggested group guidelines for how to run your local group which is just like a very lightweight version of the some of the key points of the constitution of like try and write down who's doing what and try and be clear about what your decision making process are and here's some of the options rather than having a full, fully fledged constitution. Does that, does that answer it? Yep. Well enough. Okay. And then Ash has just um, made a point there at the end that relates to that. Okay, I see Mark, you've got a couple more questions. Do you want to take a stab at one of those? Yeah, let me see if I can uh, remember what they were. Let me just have a look. Uh, yeah, one I think would be useful. Um, you did briefly touch on it um, from somebody else's question, but it's the idea of the internal coordinators ability to ask somebody to step down from a role um, 
and we've just found in the regions that that's having some problems um, in one way people are kind of weaponizing it and in another way they're not wanting to do it because it's onerous so you're kind of getting both ends of the spectrum happening and we were thinking would there be uh, an easy way to make it a group decision rather than just being on on the head of one person uh, um, and also so that one person couldn't sort of use it as a threat which just has happened in a couple of instances yeah sure so if somebody was feeling attention about that going back to what i said about it being tension driven someone was feeling attention about that they could propose a policy in governance that would say something like you know no person may be asked to um, step out of a role or be or leave a circle without a majority vote of members of that circle and what that would do that policy then effectively would constrain the authority of the internal coordinator who who has that authority it would constrain it saying okay i can't make this decision on my own i need to manage a process by, that uses this voting process to allow that to happen yeah i guess i was kind of specific more specifically um thinking if we were to do something like that um what what would be the, the way of doing it we were trying to think i mean I, I know there isn't much time so i probably can't go into too much detail and stop me if i am doing but um if a problem was noticed within a team somebody could bring that to the internal coordinator they could try to help the situation and if it turned out that it wasn't possible to help it then they could a process could be brought to the to the group to decide and mm -hmm. then where i got a bit stuck was um would it be a majority vote would that be the best way of doing it and that seemed possibly problematic but maybe it's the best way and i just wonder if you had any thoughts on that i would defer to the kind of you know i can give some suggestions you know sometimes majority votes not the best thing sometimes it could be a vote with a, a minimum um threshold of two thirds or three quarters so that's another option or you could avoid voting altogether and say you know if there's an issue uh it needs to be first of all it needs to go through some kind of process in the people space you know so not looking at roles not looking at operations or governance but looking at the interpersonal relationships as a separate dimension and then bring in somebody who's skilled at facilitating interpersonal processes and saying let's let's work in that dimension first so outside of voting and governance and all those things just to work through the issues that's another option another option is um you know anybody can propose somebody leaves and then that goes through integrative decision integrative decision making so like are there any objections to that you know you might have to create a, a adapted version of integrative decision making because it's not around roles and policies but it's around someone leaving so it's, it's a different thing but there may be a time where somebody could give make a proposal and there could be objections and work with it in that way so those are a couple of different options but i would really want to defer to the group and just like give it back to the group like what would work best for you you know if you're in a situation where you know in describe the situation what do you think would work best and then groups can make up their own kind of custom processes so i'm not giving you any kind of firm answer but some kind of options yeah no, that's not, thanks that's okay. great all right i know you've got a role around personal versus a question around personal versus operational spaces i think i've covered all the rest of the questions i'm just checking So if I have covered all of Paul's questions, um, so I know Mark's got one left around personal audit and organizational space. Does anybody else have anything else um, that hasn't that you put in the chat that I haven't yet covered or addressed? I know some of the questions have been dropped. If not, I'll go on and do Paul. So Yanai, have you got one? It's not in the chat, um, and this may not be a question for this conversation, so tell me if it's not. Um, something I see and find it difficult to know how to work with well um, within XR, and I'm in the guardianship and positioning circle, um, in that is when there is power being used where there isn't a clear attribution or recognition of it. So it's basically power that's not transparent. And how to include that 
and therefore not accountable. How to include that within the structure? And, and some of that is the soft power of, you know, status. Um, some of it is to do with founders sometimes or people who have charisma and not criticizing any of that, but it's more like, how does one engage with that within a system where it's, it's not made explicit and because of the decentralized nature of the system, it's, it's actually quite effectively possible to say, well, no, we don't have that, but the reality is it's there. Oh, I love that question. And Jonathan does as well. And it relates to Mark's final question around personal versus organizational space. Okay. So I'll take the remaining time. We've got up to five minutes left. I'll take the remaining time to address this. Um, because there's a number of different angles. So one way of approaching this is to ask the question of what kind of power is it? You know, you mentioned soft power. So to, to make the distinction between um, formal authority, which would be defined in, in a role definition, you know, so it'd be a purpose or accountabilities of a role or in a policy. It's like, here's the formal authority and the, that form of power that somebody has. If that's not yet captured and somebody's sensing that as power that's being exerted untransparently, that is attention that somebody could bring to a meeting, make a proposal using integrated decision-making process so that it's then added to the governance. So it then becomes transparent. So that's the easy way, right? In self in kind of holacracy based stuff, organizing systems, that's the easy way. The harder way is where the power is more kind of hidden. Maybe it's social power, it's other kind of influence, it's rank, status, privilege, um, all the different kind of multitudes of, of soft power. And that's where a personal space becomes really important uh, and make this distinction between two different kinds of domains or spaces in an organization. Organization space where you do the work and you have the roles, personal space where you have the people who show up as people, and that's where the soft power is. And it's to do with relationships, it's to do with all kinds of you know charisma and all kinds of exertions of soft power that, are, that is unaccountable. And what's essential, like essential, which is the reason that I don't do pure Holoxy adoptions anymore, but I always do a mixture of other things as well, is that you have some ways of creating enough safety and trust in the people space to be able to have those kinds of conversations around that power and around that influence. And you can't have those conversations without creating, doing the work to create some safety and trust to do it because it's too unsafe to do it. So people don't bring it up or people who have the power exert the power in unaccountable ways. Um, and this is a big topic. And I've written, that's what I'm going to do now is I'll refer you. I've written a series of nine articles about this called where is the psychological safety for speaking truth to power in self-organization? So it's really, it's like bang on this issue. It took me a long time to write those articles. And I think they're really, really important because it's neglected in a lot of self-organizing work. So I'll put the link to that article in the chat so you can get it before you drop off. Um, I'm just going to have a look for it now. Just as you're doing that, Nick, thank you. That was really, really clear and helpful. And, uh, okay, great. I underline essential <laughs> when you used it. Yeah. Yeah. Great. There you go. I and think... thank you for doing this work. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. I mean, it's it's based on what I just said is based on like 25 years of pain and blood and sweat and tears of, you know, going through this and not finding the answers and struggling with it and trying to learn different processes and so on. So yeah, those articles have have the kind of longer answer to it. So we're two minutes from the end. I'm not going to take any more questions now. Um, if you need to drop off uh, and go and do something else, feel free to do that. If you want to stay and check out and do a closing round, um, I'm going to st hold a space for doing that. So anybody who wants to go, feel free to wave and go. Otherwise, I'll invite you to give a closing comment. Thanks, Thank Nick, you. Really useful. Thanks for your participation. Bye bye. Thanks. Got a meeting, so uh, I've got to right. run. But thanks Thank so you. much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks. So, is anybody staying? Let me see. There's a few left. So, if you want to, um, I'll go through the order I see you on the screen. So, Emily, do you want to say anything to to close or check out? Um, yeah, just thanks very much. I came one of Jamie invited me because I was asking about some SOS questions and it was 
really helpful and it's given me renewed vigor for <laughs> some SOS, not issues, but concerns maybe in my group. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Good. Yeah, no. Yes, I just also came sort of on Jamie's invitation in the last minute and I've actively sort of not engaged with this territory too much in XR and I'm actually really glad I did thank you and I, mm. I feel the support for a sort of a whole body of wisdom which I have some exposure to from other places that I sense you're integrating it into your vision that I'm not sure is in XRs yet. And you know, when you use words power and rank, I think straight away, yes, this is what <laughs> needs to be understood and handled as you described. So thank you, I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah. glad to have a chance to check it out as well. Jonathan. Yeah, I'm, I'm very grateful. I'm grateful for your question, Yane. Thank you very much for that. And for your answer, Nick, and for the article you just posted. I'm really looking forward to looking at that. I think one of the things that we're addressing is uh, our organization has moved its change from being a, um, a nonprofit company to being a charity. And so we've had to set up a board of trustees. And I, I consider there to be quite a lot of tension and um, mistrust between uh, us as trustees and where the traditional power has been and we need to have some open discussions about how which decisions are made where and who has what responsibility so I'm really looking forward to um, uh, looking at those articles and, and reading through them and I really appreciate your willingness to share them with us thank you it's been a very helpful session thank you thank you and Nunu you're closing yeah, thank you. It was really interesting. And um, just a reflection. Um, I teach uh, SOS in, in, in Barcelona, XR and Animal Rebellion. And because there's a lot of new people and there's the, the people that's been there forever that are kind of like, no one knows what SOS is. It's kind of like, and um, they uh, started to become like a dysfunctional like a uh, group and um and i don't know i just like uh how important it is to to know like for me like so, so this like a passion is something like the first for first uh, moment i joined uh it's our an animal rebellion in Berlin, and uh, it was amazing. But I don't know. People seem just like um, that they can go on like working without knowing sauce, and that that really just uh, it's and and then they come and ask me things, but it's like so difficult. Like it must be like like for you and Nick, like if you know a lot. And then people just, how can I do this? And I said, like, oh my God, shall I start from the start and everything? But yeah, I'm trying to, yeah, to spread so as much as I can and, and, and use it properly. And, and yeah, thank you. I'll tell the guys to let me come more often. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, yeah. So I'll close. So thank you everybody for showing up your questions. I um, sounds like it was a service. I um, hope it was. That's um, my ambition. And yeah, it's uh, it fulfills an ambition of mine to be of service in this way. So thank you for allowing me to do that. All right. See you next time, maybe. Thank you, Nick, and thank you everybody. Thank yeah. you. Goodbye. Bye bye. Bye.